Okay, hello, my name is Paul Wallace of DDN and welcome to our session today entitled Three Ways to Simplify Data Migration for AI Analytics and HPC. I'd like to start first today by thanking our partners Atempo for hosting us today in this joint event. Um, Atempo and DDN have joined forces to build a range of solutions to help you move and migrate data at scale. And we'll be looking at how that can help with those data migration challenges. Feel free to post questions uh, during the session via the question panel on your console. We've scheduled 30 minutes for today's session, and we'll be covering a lot of interesting material in a very short time. Um, so we'll aim to go through the questions at the end, but we'll keep an eye out for any interesting comments and remarks uh, that come in during the main session, okay? But before we start, let's set some context. Um, AI and high-performance computing applications require massive amounts of data. And with many organizations investing in AI, we know that we'll be dealing with massively higher data volumes in three to five years than we do even now. And that trend seems to be accelerating every year. So for example, in artificial intelligence applications, we're already seeing learning models with billions of objects. The GPT-3 model, for example, natural language processing, is like 175 billion parameters, which is more than 20 times the predecessor model, GPT-2. Uh, in analytics, financial services, we're seeing real-time data streams handling billions of transactions a day. And in HPC and research, we're tackling the big science and engineering problems of cosmology, high energy physics, and fluid dynamics. So in this session, we're going to look at how organizations can approach the challenge of managing petabytes of data uh, across the entire life cycle, from creation, aggregation, processing, and archive, maintaining efficiency and compliance and visibility across that whole process. Let's move on, talk about our guest speakers for today. I'm excited to be joined by Mike Oakes from Atempo. He's a 30 year veteran in the data management industry um, from Atempo. Welcome, Mike, good to have you on. Hey, Paul, glad to be here, thank you. Yeah, and I'd also like to introduce Maria Gutierrez from DDN. Maria is responsible for the integration and adoption of the data flow solution from DDN. Thanks for joining us, Maria. Thanks, Paul. That's good. So why don't we hand over to you straight away, Maria, uh, for you to tell us about yourself and DDN and D data flow. Yeah, great. Thanks, Paul, for the introduction. Uh, well, uh, so I'm Maria Gutierrez. No, I am responsible for data flow product at DDN. And um, uh, today, first, I would like to um, introduce you in the next uh, few minutes who we are, no, uh, who is DDN, and who do we serve. So, who is DDN? So, DDN is the largest privately uh, held storage company in the world. So, we have summarized here on this slide in a few figures, no, uh, DDN for you. So, actually, the first uh, thing that better represents us is our customers. So we have more than 10,000 customers worldwide um, from multiple markets. And actually, I will go a bit uh, more into detail and I will present you uh, some of them. Uh, Didian is a company with more than 20 years of history solving the toughest data management and storage challenges in the industry. So coming from the high performance computing world, where our systems have been the de facto solution and been used to solve the largest data problems for years, we have evolved in a very natural way um, to, to address the demanding needs of uh, fast growing applications like AI, you know, deep learning and analytics are the re really hungry uh, data applications. So today we count with more than 1000 employees around the globe all focus on storage who serve our customers to enable them to uh, achieve results faster in, in the most efficient way. And uh, to finish this summary, so we have uh, 10 technology centers around the world. So here at DDN, we do a significant investment in R&D to continuously bring you know, the cutting edge technology to the market. So going back to our customers, uh, at DDM we serve so the whole spectrum of markets and customers who has a large uh, data challenge. 
So we differ from most companies which deliver data storage because first, we are 100% focused on storage and data management. So that's our core and unique uh, business. And our team is made of the best specialists on storage at scale. And secondly, we have been solving for a very long time the challenge that happen at a scale no, from our HPC history. Of course, today, at a scale does not mean the same that used to. So the fast spread of AI, no, deep learning, analytics across many organizations, whether it is on the research or on the commercial world, on the life science uh, or finance, uh, they all have these huge uh, data challenges on which actually we happen to have the experience to have been addressing them for years. So here on this slide, you can see that uh, we have customers, well, no, our customers are really prestigious and they go all the way from the medium to the very large size. So we count between them with uh, the large and national labs, um, life science institutes, and of course as well enterprise customers, and specifically all enterprise that they have the really, uh, you know, they need to manage data at very large scale. And well, between our customers, we include as well government, uh, you no know, academia, and all, you no, know, all those customers for all these kind of different uh, sectors, uh, they are today solving and addressing these uh, large uh, uh, data volumes and managing them using our technology. Um, last, I wanted to present you know, our DDM business unit. So um, DDM has acquired over uh, the past years various storage technologies and has brought you know, them together into a common portfolio. So today, you know, together to our at scale division, not where we solve this uh, very large uh, data volumes, as I was describing, we have an enterprise division, this 18 tree by DDM. So with this, we uh, offer the experience and a full range of products for enterprise virtualization, databases and clouds between others. So with these two uh, business units, uh, you know, brings the best of both worlds. And in this way, at DDM, we are in the position to address the customer needs uh, of the entire storage market. But with that, so I don't want to distract you, you know, from the topic of today. And um, with this, you, know, you should get an idea so who we are and what we do. And with that, I wanted to hand over to you, Mike. Hey, thanks, Maria. So real quickly, let me tell you a little bit about Tempo. So at Tempo, we bring to bear about 25 years of experience in the field of data protection, management, data preservation, as you see by the slides. 2,000 customers, 200 employers worldwide. We're actually well north of that. And our, our, our solutions enable organizations to preserve their data ecosystems. And that's regardless of the data set size, you know, its location, or even the organization size. And the solution is designed to protect, store, facilitate movement, provide easily searchable functionality, and quick retrieval of data. Basically, any data, anywhere, anytime. So for what we're talking about today, we're talking about crafting a comprehensive storage strategy for you know, petabyte scale analytics, HPC. And there's some serious challenges that needed to be addressed. And one of the things, the first one, of course, the bullet says it all, right? Scalable capacity management. You need to be able to manage data wherever it resides in the data landscape manage, and manage it efficiently. And it goes to the second bullet in hybrid infrastructures because you may not have all, and most don't, have all the same types of uh, data appliances. You may need to bring something off cloud into an exascaler, maybe go from exascale to grid scale or some type of NAS. So you need a, I call them hybrid or they call them hybrid infrastructure. I call it more of a heterogeneous infrastructure, right? Bringing all the tools of an alliance or an organization to bear to be used in their, their preservation and data protection. And that goes directly to thinking about availability of data and air gap protection, especially with the, the advent of more crypto viruses and so forth, having things on tape, or there's a notion of um, a hybrid, we'll call it air gap, where the, the network will spin up, data will be moved to the, the target appliance, and then the network will be spun back down. So it keeps it rather segregated. But the real big one we're talking about today, especially with migration, right, it's reliable data migration. How do I get all of my data from my source to my target? And that means 
all file system permissions, all ACLs, all file system semantics, but do it seamlessly without impacting user workflows and production workflows. And that's important. You need to, can't be impacting user workflows when you're trying to migrate to a newer store, something bigger, better, faster. And the last one here we saw is a major challenge, right? Flexibility and scalability. Flexible enough because there's always a new type of storage coming down the pike and you need to have an appliance that's designed to be able to upgrade to that newer piece of storage. You don't have to do a forklift upgrade of your software. And it's scalable enough because most solutions, they'll start small in some arenas. In this arena, we're talking about HPC and I, they're rather very large, but you wanna be able to be expand when needed, not be constricted by the appliance itself. So and that's what Dataflow does really well, the ability to scale out and scale up when needed. So that being said, the, what you see here, think of these are the four pillars, right, of, of data flow, right? So at the top and the bottom, you see uh, backup and archiving. Think of those, the tried and true uh, data protection preservation. So backup, you know, from DR, things I need immediately back in case of uh, some kind of nefarious act or some something's happened to my file or files. But then archiving at the bottom, you have for, think of long-term preservation, right? being able to move things off. I don't need things that are over six months old and haven't been touched in you know, four months or haven't been accessed. Whatever those thresholds are you wanna set, you can tear those off. Let's get rid of them, right? Let's move them to another piece of storage, move them to cloud, so something cheaper so not taking up our production storage. The big one we're talking about today is more of migration. That's the one that you see at the three o'clock position, right? So and that's the one which is basically a heterogeneous tool, move your source data, to something, some newer target, something bigger, faster, smarter, right? Let's get on a Nexus here. Let's get on a grid here. Let's come off a NAS. But once you do that too, one quick point with this tool, right? Dataflow allows you, once you do the migration, now you need to protect it. Now you just need to license backup, maybe license archive, license the capacity, whatever workflow you need. But another one that was added, you'll see at the nine o'clock position. Think of this one, this is data moving, right? Think of this as sync, copy, replication, could be manual, could be automatic. So what Dataflow has done here, if you think about it on our previous slide, right, it addresses those challenges, those petabyte needs of AI, analytics, HPC, with a software appliance that scales as workflow scale, challenges change. You just need to license what you need and when you need it. Paul? First, th thanks, Mike. Look, if we take a step back a moment and think about those four pillars, we, we're looking to focus on data migration in this session. Um, I'm interested to hear from you what sort of tools customers have used in the past for moving these really large data sets. How did they approach it that you were then able to say, here's, here's what's going to be different? Right. So if you think about it, a lot of times what happens is the customer will say, well, I'm going to try RoboSync or I'm going to try uh, so RoboCopy yeah, yeah. or RSync. Sorry, I mixed those two together. And... Um, what happens is it's for a small data set, it's not bad. But when you get to very large data sets, petabytes in scale, using something that you have to program, set up cron jobs, it's like taking a Pinto to the Indy, 5, you know, the Indy 500. You're going to get crushed with the amount of work you're going to have to do. And Dataflow simplifies that, right? It allows you to program, do all, all interfaces through GUI, if you so choose, to make everything simple, but also offload the admins from any kind of further having to administer, you know, multiple machines throughout an entire infrastructure. Yeah, I guess you're going to place quite a heavy workload on the infrastructure when you're going to do that, particularly with these really large loads. Um, so maybe put it across maybe to Maria. Um, what sort of experience have you had with customers using data flow for migration of those really large data sets? How does it, how does it make a difference and what experience have they had? Well, so with Dataflow, we have no, uh, no very good experiences already that really has demonstrated you know, how is the migration of a large data set. So we have had customers that really, they try exactly the, the approach Mike, uh, Mike was commenting, you no know, use our scene, own scripts. Um, after several um, failures, so we really you know, came to us and then thanks to uh, data flow we were able to complete them successfully you know is is key you know with data flow that really is the process and guarantee that can be completed so because with data flow we um, it's possible to overcome any issues along the migration that might happen you no know, moving especially so large volumes you can have uh, network issues uh, hardware issues data transfer is breaking at some point 
So with um, data flow, we can pick up you know, and continue the, the data migration where was left. And this is actually a big uh, advantage, you know, uh, this from my point of view. Um, now, so Mike, probably you can describe that, but really that how to pick up, you know, be able to go and continue efficiently that data movement is, is, is really um, a key thing. Yeah, so if you think about you know, data flow, for instance, here, especially with the migration, there's, there's multiple ways you can set up a system or we can set up a system for you. But what becomes important to your point, Maria, is getting things migrated or moved efficiently. And what Dataflow does is has a couple different tools under the hood. One of them we call FastScan, and it allows the movement of data without having to walk a file system as long as we can talk to the API. And that really enables quick changes, and that goes back to let's not impact the user, let's not impact the workflow, while we're moving or transferring data from one point to another. Yeah, what you said, you no, know, it's very important. You no, know, like this feature that really allows uh, you no know, data flow to detect changes and optimize that process is at the same time optimizing you not know, the change detection and is as well um, offloading even the source system. You no, know, in a migration process, as we see on the slide, we are moving data from source to target. Uh, usually, we have to do several cycles, uh, and then you no. Know, to reduce the, the final cut uh, and don't detect those changes uh, without going through that um, full scan. No, it's really a benefit, but at, at the same time, we are guaranteed that production is running smoothly for users. Um, and there, so this FastCan feature, uh, Mike, um, is available actually for multiple file systems, right? Yeah, that's correct. So if we can talk to the API of like the NAS, maybe like an Isilon, a Cumulo, a NetApp, um, as well as it's available for a, a GPFS or grid scaler, it's a little different for Exascaler. Instead of doing those all use what we call it, the previous ones use like a snapshot. We'll take a snapshot first time the data is being moved or migrated and we'll walk it to validate it. Then second time around, we'll take another snapshot and we'll have the appliance give us a differential change just that you were talking about. In the case of Exascaler, what will happen is we're actually collecting all the change logs. And what we'll, what we'll do is instead of using the snapshot, we'll go to that server, build the change list from that server, anything needs to be acted upon, and then move that data accordingly. Again, all without having to walk or tree walk that particular source file system. Yeah, so that's a huge benefit, you know, to, to moving data and, as you mentioned, not doing it from uh, multiple, uh, from different systems. So, and that actually, this FastCan uh, feature is, is, of course, something that benefits uh, not only migration, but all the workflows that the data flow covers, right? Yeah, correct. So you can use it for backup, you can use it for uh, archive. One interesting tool you can do with backup, there's something we call SnapStore. So you can actually use a backup as a DR. And what you're doing is if we can talk to the APIs on both sides of the appliances, which source and target, from a backup perspective, you basically take a snapshot, we move that change list, and on the other side on the new target, we'll take another snapshot, and that's your version control. So we'll move all files, all permissions, all metadata. So in the case of a DR scenario or something goes down, you could point to it and run on it right away. Maybe it's a smaller system or something less than production, but keeps you up as well as you have time navigation version control because of the snapshot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there, something that you just mentioned and you, um, I don't know, you referred before as well is when moving data, no, we are really preserving uh, no permissions, ACLs, uh, no extended attributes, and that's really key for all the projects. And we can do it even when we are doing migration from one type of system to a different one, right? Yeah, that's correct. So we'll move all the all the data. We'll also move all of the ACLs, the metadata, file system attributes. The other thing that what happens too is with migration with um, with data flow is. For some reason, should someone make a change accidentally on the target side, maybe somebody messed with the metadata, if we'll use that as an example. You don't have to recopy all the data. There's some tools under the hood. You can hit a button that will turn into a copy mode. It'll go and check all those permissions and just fix them without having to recopy all the data. Well, um, here now we have this uh, slide that represents the full migration and something that really I like to um, 
to uh, remark is uh, not that flexibility that really we can cover moving from anything not to anything even cloud right like so we can move data from the cloud or to the cloud from on-prem and those all those cases are, are covered as well with data flow correct yeah we call it reverse it's almost like a reverse migration so i need, maybe i want to bring something off of aws azure google and put it back on an exascaler. You can use the tool to do that. You can use the appliance to do that. Or you can go to multiple. You can come from multiple locations. You go many to one, one to many. Choice is yours. It all depends on how you design and set up the workflow. Mm -hmm. um, the um, efficiency moving data, no, we have not uh, referred to that, no, uh, starting on the presentation, but how really data flow does that in a different way from two other solutions. Right, so we already talked about FASCA, which is kind of different than the others in the industry. But we also do things a little differently with, with the data movers for data flow. And what happens here is you may have two, four, or six, you could have you know 20 data movers, and you can pool them and put them together to improve performance. But in that pooling, you can set up what we think of as basically jobs or sub jobs or some task when you're firing up a main task or automatically firing up a main task. And what this will do is we'll start looking for data against some criteria that are tunable under the hood. It's like the task is run for so much time or maybe it's found so much data that needs to be acted upon or so many files that need to be acted upon. And it, when we reach one of those high watermarks, we'll fire what we call a sub job and you can set maybe 10 sub jobs and five data movers you have in a pool. It'll fire up a job and continue looking for data at the same time. And next time it reaches a high watermark, it'll fire up another sub job until it gets to those 10 sub jobs. And we'll place them across that pool of data movers, two per data mover if they're all available. So we, we're basically paralyzing while we're looking for data, right? And we're paralyzing across the data movers. But also what we do is there's cores within these data movers and let's not let them sit idle. So we'll use those as copy engines and you can tune those as well. So we paralyze across those data movers like you mentioned, but then we start multi-threading through them. This gets you the best performance. The data is moved or protected that much faster without having to impact the user because you can dial things up and down to meet the workflow against the, the source storage you're trying to get data off of. Um, as well, no, we are talking about we can put so many data movers as we need and not uh, paralyze. And it's as well very flexible. Like if we are facing a migration at some point for any reason has to be a speed up, it's possible just to you know, live, uh, join, you know, add resources and speed up the, the process, right? Yep, and that goes to that scalability I was talking about early on. So you can add data movers as you need to, or even shut them off, put them in the pool, turn them off. We just won't use them if they're not seen. If they're seen, we'll go ahead and use them for whatever job transfer they've been assigned to. So um, now here we are talking about the, you know, the workflow, the features of data flow. No, but during a migration, no, what, as we were uh, referring, so really usually implies a lot of work for the administrator. No how a uh, data flow really makes you know, the administrator life along the migration process easier. Yeah, so we went through about a couple years back, started looking at revamping the process for this. And what we did is we came out with an HTTP, HTTPS web GUI for migration. So you can manage a migration anywhere in the world as long as you have access. And that means you can configure the storage, configure all the tasks, but it's all GUI driven. That includes setting up schedules, that includes maybe doing exclusions or inclusions to what you want to move and not move, but it's all managed from one tool, has a dashboard with it, and it's a daily dashboard, like how many objects and or maybe how much data has been moved, as well as you can break down the projects and get granular to take a look at what they've done. Maybe you want to make some changes or tweak them, all done from one GUI if you so choose. Yeah, and that's uh, not that tracking capabilities of data flow. That's something that really uh, you know, brings a lot of value to administrators. They can really follow the process. They can have partial reports. They can you know, report how is the process going. All of that is um, is not via this GUI, really simple to access and to follow along the entire uh, you know, migration. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you just brought up a really good point. So with every job that runs, you get a report. And the thing about that report is eventually, especially during a migration, you have to do a cutover, but you need to know how long it's going to take to do the cutover. Inside each one of those reports, maybe when you're doing your incrementals to catch up from your daily change rate, it'll tell you how long it took to run, 
what it moved, like how many files or how many directories, also how many had to delete, because you can run this in echo mode, which makes source match target. And if we had to delete anything on target, we'll also tell you how to delete X amount of files. But at the end, it gives you a complete histogram of how long it took to run. So you can set expectations with the users or the corner office people to say on a Tuesday, it's going to take me two hours at midnight to do my cutover. And then I'm going to switch the user. So we take a four hour window. Everybody gets level set with the expectations that way. And uh, back to the not to keeping data safe and move no data unchanged. So with data flow, we can uh, make sure that's happening. All the data, you no, know, is there are some checksum, there are hashing available. Um, it's possible be, as well to get that and not just on the fly, but get all that information about the data that has been migrated and being able to check that afterwards. Yeah, and there's two ways you can do this. There's a block level, which uses XX hash 64, which is just going to check on the read of the data and just before we write it. And it's going to actually then it compare them. If they match, it'll complete the transaction. If not, it'll throw it off the stack. The one you're getting to is a, is a feature we put in that allows you to do it at the file level. And this puts a little more load on those, those processors and those cores because you have to do that file level calculation. But you can do in line we'll, when we pick up the data will calculate the hash and you can choose the hash you want. Maybe MD5, maybe XX hash 64, SHA something or other, you get to choose. We'll store that in the database along with the time it was, it was read and the hash. And then we'll apply it down to the target. And then right after we finish applying it in that particular task that was run, we'll turn around and kick a subtask off that'll go back and reread all the stuff that was just transferred, all the data. Recalculate that hash, put it in the database and then Put the uh, put the date in there as well, so you can basically have your hash. It's you can print it out as a CSV report for validity, but you also can run a secondary check just by running out of the database. I want to do a hash check against this bucket, and it will go and run again against it completely and check everything one more time if you want. Yeah, that's absolutely. Uh, um, no, I think a key feature that for some customers really you not know, needing to track on to do an audit after the migration, not for their applications, and you not know, brings uh, a lot of value, right? Yeah, so, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I, we have touched you no know, uh, some of the you know, high, um, the higher, more important, or more relevant uh, features of the data flow to ease the, the migration. So here is a, is a summary. You know, we have one of the main benefits that we have with that. For me, this is a really good uh, you know, uh, summary of the benefits of a data flow. Is there anything, uh, Mike, that you think that should be added is not uh, really uh, represented here? Well, and I think that these three summarize it pretty well, and I'm moving data efficiently, but it's also moving data from any appliance to any appliance, and it's any location in the world, too. So if you need to migrate between organizations or locations somewhere geographically, you can also put data movers in, and we can do basically uh, encryption in flight. So you also can do protection as you're moving data. Yeah, and then the task management and, and uh, monitoring we talked about, the centralized security and compliance reporting, that's a big one. That's becoming more and more of a requirement in finance, healthcare, and anybody that's doing really kind of big data transactions, you need to make sure you can do some uh, reporting to tell people what was done, when it was done, and what the hashes were and so forth. Okay, great. Well, yeah, the, these top, Top areas, the, the efficiency, task management, and centralized security and compliance really cover a lot of ground that, we, uh, that we've that we been talking about. Um, and I think that's been, been really great to hear that. And I think um, as uh, back, back to the audience, as you heard, DDN and A-Tempo have joined forces to build this range of solutions to help you move and migrate the data at scale, helping with data migration challenges. And if you'd like to hear more about that, then we've got a lot more resources posted on our website, including data sheets, customer case studies, and more. So what I'd like to do, actually, in uh, we're more or less at the end of time, we've got plenty more time we can stay on to look, for, look at questions. Um, so don't forget, you can post questions in the, in the window on the console. Do go ahead and do that. Um, we also, uh, all, all feel free to question, send an email to us afterwards. I think in the chat window, we've got our emails there. Contact us directly if you've got any more questions as well. You'll also see a poll section on the console where we've posted a place for you to share your feedback. We'd love to hear your comments and feedback from me on this session as well. But while we're opening up for, for questions, um, got a couple coming along in a moment. Um, 
question for Mike, actually. Um, you, you've talked about um, it, you know, it could take half an hour or even longer to an hour to move into a very large data set. Um, and you also talked about maybe being able to run a few jobs in parallel. What, is there a limit to how many of those jobs I can run in parallel? How does it impact efficiency and, and how would you plan that? It more goes to think about the infrastructure in play because right? you don't want to over if you're running on the same network as all the production users are running, you don't want to just take up and the bit and the data movers can do this 100% of the network bandwidth. So you want to make sure you you scale it back a little to make sure you don't overwhelm, but you can scale it up as needed and scale it down depending on the jobs you're running. Okay, so there's a bit of flexibility there. Mm -hmm. um, Question over, of Costa Maria. We talked a little about cloud migration and different sources, different targets. Um, can you just go into just which clouds are currently supported and what our plans are for managing that? Yes, of course. So we cover today with Dataflow. We support all the main uh, cloud providers, so AWS, um, Azure, um, GCP, um, WhatsApp, England. So we really uh, know it's... Uh, we can move data from any of the of them, and actually, is any uh, storage that is providing an S3 interface will be supported and will be you know, possible to move data to or move data from to to them. So that gives a full, uh, you know, um, you know um, field you know, for of flexibility to cover all, most of them. So that's great. That'll fit in with a lot of different um, uh, environments as well. There's a couple of questions I can see on the console in front of me. Um, one question I'm going to put, put to Mike. Um, the question's come in here. The question is, is the data migration applicable to luster storage um, as opposed to exascale, which you did mention? Yep, it's, it, it's, a, it's applicable to both. So both the luster stream as well, or branch, as well as the exascale branch. Okay, that's fantastic. There's another one here. Uh, I'll put this to Maria as well, um, about optimal speed of uh, transfer. Um, whether Dataflow cuts larger files into chunks, maybe, uh, to migrate in parallel? Does it does it help to overcome the bandwidth limit of a single data mover? So today, uh, the, a single file is uh, unloaded by, by a data mover, so that's not a split. That's something that is going to be uh, added in the roadmap of the process. But today, really, no, as uh, Mike was describing, thanks to the use of multi-threading, okay. you know, it's able to do the upload at a very optimal speed, so we have made sure uh, Know, really high bandwidth uh, moving file uh, large files but yeah that's as well a feature that that is coming yeah. okay okay that'll be great um, another question back to Mike actually we, we're talking about data movers um, you can actually scale them up uh, add more and more to increase parallelism do, do you have any sizing guidance for system designers maybe it's on, on the website or somewhere yeah, there's a there's a couple guides you can get straight from DDN on sizing your um, your data movers, but typically you're talking about one U boxes, you know, two CPUs, X amount of cores depending on the workflow and some memory. They're not large boxes; they just need to have some a little bit of resource in them to do the type of uh, functionality you need to do would be archive, backup, migration, and so forth. Okay, good, good. And a question to you both, actually. Um, I'm interested, in, imagine you've got to, uh, an organization is starting out on this journey. They've got a particular, looking at their overall workflow. Um, we had that slide earlier that talked about requirements in our through to verification. What do you think are the, the, the first two or three steps that uh, an organization should take? Maybe it's auditing the data, an inventory of, of that, or looking at, where, where do you think they would start? What's the one or two first steps? So from, from the standpoint of understanding, basically we talk about the data environments. You've got to understand your data landscape first and what you need to accomplish. And that doesn't just include the data. That includes what are my connection mediums between the data, how busy are my file systems, or what the apparatuses I'm going to use. So understanding the infrastructure can help you get to that next step and, okay, I need to back up certain things and this is what I need to do. So you don't want to put so the heart, the, excuse me, the cart before the horse. I misspoke that one. Okay, good. Uh, there's another question coming. I'll, I'll put it to um, it's Maria as well. Um, whether data flow is included for existing DDN customers? Well, so data flow is, is, is of, co of course available for DDN uh, customers. So I guess the question goes in the direction if it's something like included with the product. So usually data flow is a addition so that can be uh, provided depending on the use case or for the migration and then we need to cope especially on migration use cases always we need to um, to really 
define the scope and know and really size properly the the project but it's available and, and if you are interested always no contact your DDN no uh, main sales or well any of us and of course we will we will give you, you know some um, information on how how we can how we can do it okay great okay well i'll tell you what with that um i think we'll probably uh, bring it to a close now i'd really love to thank my two speakers for today mike oaks from a tempo and maria gutierrez from ddn thank you both for joining us today thank you uh, thank, thank you both thanks everybody and thanks also to A Tempo for hosting this event with us, a um, great partnership. And thank you to, for our audience for joining us today. Uh, look out for more sessions like this one soon uh, on data management at scale with DDN and A Tempo. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye. Cheers.